Today, uh, we'll be talking about Shinron. Um, but before we jump in, I want to introduce myself again. My name is uh, Aaron Prophet. Um, uh, I'm an assistant professor of Japanese studies at uh, SUNY Albany. Uh, my PhD is in Buddhist studies from the University of Michigan. Um, my uh, area of study is medieval Japan, and uh, I teach various classes in religious studies and uh, Japanese studies, Buddhist studies, and so on. I'm excited to talk about Shinron today. Uh, we've done several other uh, intro uh, classes, basic Buddhist ideas, um, as well as uh, um, uh, Mahayana Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, and kind of working our way towards Shinron in a sense. Um, before we jump in, I wanted to talk a bit about how I got interested in studying Shinron. Um, uh, I, I'm not a classically trained Shin studies uh, scholar. Um, I'm not a Shin theologian, necessarily. Uh, I'm a scholar of medieval Japanese Buddhism, broadly speaking. And Shinran is certainly one of the most important people who lived during that time. Um, but interesting, interestingly enough, or sadly enough, uh, Shinran is not widely known and not widely studied uh, in the Anglophone world, the English speaking world, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I first got interested in Shin Buddhism and the, uh, Shinran's thought when I was living in rural Kumamoto Prefecture in southern Japan. Um, I had uh, been interested in Buddhism for a long time, had been you know, you know, a long time meditator, I went to college, majored in religious studies, read every book I could get my hands on about Buddhism. Then I moved to Japan and found this thing called Jodo Shinshu. And I was really struck because you know, it's the largest, you know, I learned that Jodo Shinshu is the largest school of Buddhism in Japan, has been for a really long time. And I had this question, if Shin is so popular, how come I've never heard of it, right? Um, and uh, I, I was really perplexed by that. So I, so I got really interested in the methodological and historical problem of why uh, scholars have in general uh, ignored Pure Land Buddhism, despite it perhaps being one of the largest forms of Buddhism in the world, and why scholars have uh, often ignored Jodo Shinshu, which is the largest school of Buddhism in Japan and one of the most important forces in the American Buddhist world. Um, we can talk about some of these later on, perhaps, but uh, I got really interested in that problem, you know, methodologically speaking. But also, um, you know, hanging out in this in this community in, in southern rural Japan, um, I, I met Buddhists who were very different than uh, the people that I had met in the United States who were, who were practicing Buddhists. Um, I'd gone to university uh, at uh, CU Boulder, um, which you know is a, is a very Buddhist town. Um, but what I what I often encountered in that environment is what some scholars are referring to as the upper middle way Buddhism. This means Buddhism that is by and for um, you know an affluent white audience. And you know, given my own background as someone from the rural South, from a working class background, there were some various reasons, cultural and otherwise, where that didn't quite fit with me. Um, I also wasn't quite ready to give up my whiskey and barbecue uh, pulled pork or whatever at that time. Um, but then I, I moved to the small town in Japan and I was, you know, my, my students, my friends in the community, my neighbors were by and large Jodo Shinshu Buddhists. And they invited me to their temple to chat with their priests when they found out I was interested in Buddhism. And just kind of one after one after the other, right? Uh, this one time, I was hanging out with a friend of mine, and uh, one of his other friends was there, and you know, we'd been you know enjoying shochu and beer, and you know, eating fried chicken and smoking cigarettes, and just you know, having having a party time, right? And my friend mentioned, "Oh, hey, my buddy here is a priest. You should go check out his temple." And I was so surprised. I was like, "How could it, how could you know anyone associated with something wholesome like Buddhism be in?" You know, and, and you know, in this uh, this this party time, you know, environment we were in, uh, so I was immediately intrigued. Like, you know, you mean there's a kind of Buddhism for someone who, you know, you know, a little rough around the edges like me, you know? Uh, and I thought that was really interesting, kind of learning more about uh, Jodo Shinshu and Shinran, and there were things that just kind of clicked about it, um, you know, intellectually, philosophically, culturally, and otherwise. Um, it kind of felt like the South in Japan and the South in the United States kind of uh, converged in some ways that were interesting to me and Jodo Shinshu was part of that. Uh, so in any case, let, let, uh, let, let's jump into uh, some basic information about Shinran and the study of uh, Pure Land Buddhism. So first off, let's think about what we mean by this term Pure Land Buddhism. 
um, what is Pure Land Buddhism? Uh, there are uh, at least two different ways of thinking about it. Uh, on the one hand, you could think of Mahayana Buddhism as a Buddhism of pure lands. Non-Mahayana systems today, so what we might call Theravada Buddhism, uh, generally don't have much to do with you know, Buddha lands of, of other Buddhas. Right? Uh, you can see the previous lectures we did on Pure Land Buddhism, where we talked about the diversity of, of you know, the Pure Land mythos of the Buddha Amitabha, as well as the, um, the kind of cosmological view within Mahayana Buddhist literature that our world is not the only world. There are other worlds throughout the Ten Directions where Buddhas are currently abide and are currently teaching. Um, so in a sense, Pure Land Buddhism is an aspect of the Mahayana in general. It's an assumed component of the Bodhisattva path. As you progress along the Bodhisattva path, you may visit these other Buddhas. As you progress along the Bodhisattva path, you may in fact create one of these pure lands. And in some cases, uh, this, you know, traversing through the pure lands of the 10 directions, the creating of a, of a, of a pure land may be aspects of your very own mind right here and now. So uh, in some cases, the cosmology is grand, and uh, in some cases, it gets kind of collapsed into you know, the eternal now, let's say. Uh, in any case, um, you could think of you know, Pure Land Buddhism uh, as, as, a, as a basic component of Mahayana Buddhist cosmology, soteriology, um, you know, the path to Buddhahood, and, and so on. Um, however, there's another way that Pure Land Buddhism is often defined, and that's in relation to particular movements within medieval Japanese Buddhism. Uh, somewhere between the 10th and 13th century, some interesting things begin to develop in Japan, um, um, where we have a, a Buddhism of the Pure Land. Uh, so perhaps with, you know, thinking about Pure Land Buddhism as an aspect of Mahayana, you might think of it as uh, Mahayana Buddhism is the Buddhism of Pure Lands, plural, but within medieval Japan, we have, uh, you know, the development of a, of a an approach to Buddhism that is focused uh, almost exclusively on a particular Buddha, the Buddha Amitabha, and a particular pure land, Sukhavati, the land of bliss, Gokuraku Jodo uh, in Japanese. Um, these pure land movements are generally lay oriented, uh, kind of taking for granted this idea that um, the, you know, if the Buddha represents perfect compassion, then the most, you know, compassionate approach to Buddhist practice would not be the most difficult, but rather the path to practice that is the most universal, right, that the easiest to practice. Um, we see a lot of, you know, uh, elite scholar monks who are keenly interested in Pure Land Buddhism, as well as what we might call unofficial monks, monks who are kind of off on their own, teaching in the countryside, uh, practicing in the mountains, uh, who are also keenly interested in what it means to, um, you know, aspire to be reborn in a pure land. Now, in some cases, to be reborn in a pure land means when you die, you are reborn in another land, right? And there are, are elaborate descriptions of the jewel trees and golden ponds and um, lotuses and, you know, magical floating harps and flutes and, and, uh, the, and uh, biwa. Um, you know, floating around the pure land, you know, strum the guitar and it says Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Um, and then there are other cases where to be reborn in a pure land is something that is within this mind, within this body, within this world, this world in the pure land being non-dual. So um, when we talk about pure land Buddhism, there's a lot of diversity there. Um, but something that's interesting about pure land Buddhism is that it bridges this divide of, you know, elite and commoner uh, Buddhism. So it's not limited to, um, you know, peasant religion, which is the common stereotype about Pure Land, um, but there are many different ways that people approached it. Uh, one of the central practices that we see within, um, you know, the Pure Land path uh, is what's called the Nembutsu, the recitation of the name of the Buddha Amitabha as Namo Amida Butsu. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, this are, so, so namu means, you know, like, like this, like when you go to yoga class, they say namaste, right? That nama becomes namo. So it's like, you know, uh, an act of uh, uh, gratitude or uh, greeting or like hail, like to call, right? And then um, Amida is, is the, the name of this Buddha that's so popular within the Pure Land path, uh, the Buddha Amitabha, uh, which means uh, infinite light or limitless light, uh, Amitayus, which means limitless life, 
and then Butsu means Buddha, so the Buddha of limitless light and life. Um, and uh, again, you know, in some traditions, it's understood that this uh, Buddha comes to save you at the moment of death and take you to the pure land. In other cases, um, Amida Buddha is, in, is conceived of as an aspect of one's own mind um, and body, even uh, within this world, this world as, as kind of teeming with enlightenment, right? Um, and I think that what we'll see is in, in the thought of Shinran, uh, different ways that he draws upon and departs from uh, some of the Pure Land threads that are running throughout medieval Japanese Buddhism. We'll talk a little bit about Honen. Uh, Honen was Shinran's teacher, and like many of Honen's disciples, uh, you know, Shinran said, you know, I'm, I'm just telling you what you know, Honen told me, in a sense. Um, some scholars have um, emphasized the important differences and nuances that separate Shinran from, from Honen's thought, whereas other scholars see them as being basically, you know, uh, related to one another, right? Um, not really separate from one another. Um, so Honen was a, uh, was a scholar monk uh, living on Mount Hiei, uh, which was kind of like the Vatican of Japan at the time. Uh, and on Mount Hiei, monks studied all sorts of different stuff. You had the Tantras, uh, so esoteric tantric ritual practice, mantras, contemplation and worship of, of mandalas, um, the recitation of spells, long life rituals, rain making rituals, and so on, kind of the esoteric arts we might call it. Uh, you had uh, Chinese Tiantai philosophies, uh, uh, we also call it Tendai uh, in Japan. Um, think about the nature of emptiness and, you know, ultimate reality as uh, interfused within our own reality. Um, um, also forms of Zen were practiced on Mount Hiei uh, and adherence to the monastic precepts as well. So, so all of these things were kind of being practiced together, kind of interfusing uh, you know, different schools of practice, and Honen would have studied all of them. But within this, um, Honen was especially attracted to the Pure Land Path, and the Pure Land Path has been an important part of Tendai Buddhism since its founding in, in China, um, and then, in, uh, 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 then into Japan as well. Um, and uh, the, you know, aspiration for rebirth into a Pure Land was an important component of you know, the religious culture of that day. And Honen felt that, um, you know, uh, that that was the most effective way to guide people to awakening because the world was in chaos. Uh, it was a politically, uh, you know, tumultuous time, uh, a lot of violence. The rise of the samurai warrior class had destabilized how the government and society had worked in some important ways. And, you know, many people were trying to figure out how to respond to these uh, rapidly changing times. Um, Honen emphasized the idea that the Nembutsu, the recitation of the name of Amitabha, Namo Amida Butsu, was the only effective practice that would lead to rebirth in the Pure Land. Um, there was concern that this world was so chaotic, so difficult, that our capacities for practice were so in such decline that the only hope would be to go to the Pure Land, uh, to practice there, right? Um, now, I have heard scholars of Honen say that uh, Honen practiced what he preached, but this didn't necessarily preach all that he practiced. It's very interesting that, um, you know, Honen is someone who, you know, teaches this very simple practice, just say the name, right? Um, and yet he's also someone who engaged in deep forms of meditation, leading to visions of the Buddha, who I call Samadhi. And he also maintained the precepts as a monk until the day he died. So. Um, he wasn't ready to throw everything out in pursuit of the Nembutsu, but, you know, he recognized that different people have different capacities, different needs, and the Nembutsu should be a foundation for practice. Um, Honen's group was very popular, uh, even popular among the aristocracy. Um, many of the important religious founders and world history are kind of obscure during their own day, but then later on come to be very important. Um, Honen, however, was popular during his day. He was being read and his work was being debated and engaged by people at the very top of Japanese society. But um, because he was, you know, essentially uh, valorizing uh, ordinary lay Buddhist life apart from the elite institutions, he um, also uh, began to, you know, uh, 
people began to worry that he was doing too much, that he was uh, giving ordinary people too much uh, of, you know, free run. Uh, so he, um, you know, the, the elite monks on Mount Hie, after Honan had kind of gone off to do his own thing, they're like, you know, asking the government, please let us go get him, you know, uh, let, let us go get these guys, the, these, these heretics that, you know, they're, they're telling ordinary people that, that they're good enough. They're telling ordinary people, you don't need the priests and the rituals and all the stuff. You can just say the name of the Buddha. And, you know, at a time when, you know, Buddhist monks were essentially government employees in charge of your salvation, if someone's coming along and saying, you don't need all that stuff, that's an affront to the government. That's an affront to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, aristocratic monastic elite. And they just weren't having it. Uh, a few, some of his disciples ran uh, afoul of the law uh, and or uh, uh, was believed that they had uh, been inappropriate with some court ladies. That was the accusation. Uh, they had uh, performed for court ladies. The court ladies then wanted to become nuns and um, that affront uh, to, you know, uh, was enough for the emperor to say, okay, you know, go get him. And then you know, Honan's people are rounded up. Some of them are, ex are executed and the rest are exiled. Now, an important point about exile at this time is that um, it's not just, oh crap, and I have to go live in the boonies and I can't hang out in Kyoto and drink sake and write poetry or whatever. If you don't have a support system in place, exile can basically be a death sentence. Um, when you're uh, you know, in exile for a period of time, you're given a stipend of food and then you have to fend for yourself. Well. If you're, you know, an aristocrat uh, or an aristocratic scholar monk, and now you have to learn how to be a farmer, how's that going to work? <laughs> it's probably not, unless you have a support system. And, you know, other people who are exiled get taken care of by samurai families, and they go do all this other stuff, right? In any case, um, Honan's disciples were very diverse. Uh, they each kind of say, hey, we're doing what Honan taught us. Um, some argued that, you know, even calling the name of the Buddha one time sincerely with confidence was enough to guarantee rebirth, whereas others believe that you had to kind of continuously engage in practice, kind of, you know, like, like dialing in your mind to the frequency of the Pure Land. And that was the way this is, this is a, a, a particularly Chinese way of thinking about Pure Land is kind of, uh, you know, this kind of call and response, you know, you put out the effort, and then the Buddha responds, also sometimes called sympathetic resonance, I guess, uh, in any case, this was, uh, you know, so there were a lot of diversity within Honan's disciples, but uh, there's one in particular uh, that, that I'd li like to talk about. Okay, so Shenron uh, is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, um, one of the most important figures in Japanese Buddhism, you know, Japanese Buddhist history in general. Uh, the one of the most widely read uh, Buddhist figures in Japan today. Uh, you go to a Japanese bookstore anywhere in the country, pretty much, you can find, you know, so many books by and about uh, Shinran, right? Um, popular novels, uh, popular, popular novelization of his life and so on, right? Now, <clears throat> right, so Shinran began his career like Honen um, on Mount Hiei. Now, like I said, Mount Hiei is basically like the, um, you know, the Vatican of Japan. So Shinran did his training just like Honen on Mount Hiei, basically the, the, the elite institution, right? This is where, um, you know, elite families and elite um, scholars would go to get their training. And Shinran was from, you know, uh, from one of the branches of the Fujiwara family, uh, coming from this privileged background. He ends up on Mount Hiei training to be a, training to be a monk. Um, and you know, like others of his time, he would have studied broadly, you know, Tendai philosophy, Kagon philosophy, um, various forms of meditation, including Tendai and Zen, perhaps, um, probably also esoteric rituals, uh, kind of standard components of the monastic curriculum at most of the major centers around uh, Japan at the time. Um, it's, it's said that Shinran was a, uh, a doso or like attendant monk at one of the constant practice samadhi halls. So these are places where monks would engage in this kind of esoteric Tendai Pure Land form of meditation, rigorous meditation over a 90-day period. And, you know, you're not even supposed to sleep. You're just supposed to be constantly walking, constantly contemplating, constantly chanting the name of the Buddha Amitabha. Um, and then, then ultimately having a vision uh, of the Buddha, um, having a vision where um, you... Uh, um, 
you know, come to realize that self and Buddha are not two separate things, but they're one and the same. And this is based in the Tendai philosophical view of the three truths. So you have the ultimate truth of, of, of emptiness, right, of shunyata, then the provisional truth of our own apparent ordinary reality. Then you have the interfusion of those two, the unity of those two. And this is kind of at the basis of this practice that Shinran would have been in, would have been engaging engaged with. Um, by this time, this was also uh, Tendai Buddhism, or you know, the the, the Buddhist traditions on Mount Hiei uh, were deeply uh, esoteric in orientation. Um, you know, practice of the tantras, uh, mantra recitation, mandala contemplation, and so on were were, were fundamental aspects of, of of Tendai training and practice as well. And and this practice was not you know not excluded from that. Um, um, so Shinran eventually, you know, begins to find that he's not making the kind of practice, not making the kind of uh, uh, progress that he thought he should have been making. Uh, so he decided to uh, to go into retreat at Rokakudo, um, where he, uh, which is a temple down in down in Kyoto, where he has a where he has a vision, a vision of the Bodhisattva of Compassion that tells him, you know, to go find Honen to study with study with him. And if he, you know, wants to go get married, he can go do that, right? Um, so, so then later on, Shinran does marry a woman named Eshini, who we'll talk about more in a moment. And he takes on the role of neither monk nor layman. Um, he found that he just couldn't, couldn't, or, you know, either found it to be ineffective or found it to not be right for him, this, this you know, celibate monastic life. Um, and, you know, eventually he, you know, got married. Now, other monks were doing that at, a at the time, but what was kind of revolutionary about Shinran is he did it publicly, uh, intentionally, uh, to be neither monk nor layman, but this other category that is really kind of unique in the Buddhist world. Um, so Shinran is exiled along with Honen's other disciples. One of the things that's interesting about Shinran is though he becomes extremely important later on, during his lifetime, he was relatively obscure, perhaps one of the least well-known disciples of, of Honen at that time. 